On behalf of the Diocesan Pastoral Commission for Marriage and the Family and the Hong Kong Catholic Marriage Advisory Council, we thank all of you for joining this talk tonight. Tonight, we are very honored to have Father Michael Ryan to share with us the topic of Amoris Laetitia on the practice of family love. Father Michael Ryan is a professor of social ethics in the Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum. He holds a doctorate in philosophy at the Pontifical University Pretoriana in Rome. He lectures on things such as business ethics, social doctrines of the church, law, and morality. In his pastoral work in Mexico, USA, and Italy, Father Ryan has been collaborating for many years with the family section of the Movement Rightly Christi, both lecturing and counseling of things related to marriage. After this evening, I am sure that everyone will not go home empty-handed. Before we start, may I invite the Executive Secretary of the Association Pastoral Commission for Marriage and the Family, Mr. Kevin Lai. Hello, Kevin. Are you here? Hello, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> okay, everyone's on the song easy now. <laughs> now, may I invite uh, Kevin to present a token of appreciation to Father Michael Ryan. Thank you so much. Okay, Brian, let us begin. Father Ryan, please. Thank you. Well, good evening. Good evening, everybody. And um, I'm very happy to be here. I hope at the end you will also be happy. <laughs> yeah. Because it's very beautiful to share with you this theme. Uh, we all have the family at heart for different reasons. And um, I think what the Pope says in his exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, is really a gift for any family, for any couple. So tonight we're going to study and you know, see one, one part of, the, of chapter four, which is the chapter that the Pope dedicates to conjugal love. And um, we will take only one part of that because it's very long. But uh, I invite you then also to, to read and study what we will not speak about tonight. So um, I like to use some symbols to begin the talk. One is this symbol. You see this couple tripping up on the everyday things of life, you know, the toys and the, the you know. But nevertheless, in spite of the difficulties, and in spite of that they're falling, they actually kiss. No? So it's a symbol to say that in spite of difficulties, the union and the affection and marriage you know, must grow rather than let itself be put back. You know? So that's one of the symbols. The other symbol is more, is more worldly. Um, yeah. which is this one. Don't be satisfied with a low-cost relationship, but aim at the seven-star excellency. That hotel on the right, you know what it is, no? It's the hotel in Dubai, I think. <laughs> seven-star, which is a kind of a symbol of we must go for excellency, no? I'd like to just to mention it, uh, and it's, um, it's the image that Saint, uh, the prophet Jeremiah gives us in chapter 18, God tells Jeremiah, go down to the, the potter's house and I'll speak to you there. So he went down and he saw the man working. He was working on a, on a, a vase, you know, of, of a, and, and he, he saw that when it broke or when it wasn't as he wanted, he, he let it fall, he'd break it up again. And then with the same clay, with the same material, he would build a new one as he wanted it. 
And that is also, God used it to say, well, that's what I want to do with my people, Israel. And I'd like to apply that also to every marriage, every family, so that when we have problems or when we have difficulties, well, it's the same clay, the same people can make another effort and bring out something beautiful. So these are the three symbols that I use. Then, there's two calls. I'd like to say this, no? There's a call from Familiaris Consortio, which is 1981. And I like also to put that into the minds of everyone. No, the Pope says, I'll read it with you. It is therefore indispensable, urgent, that every person of goodwill endeavor to save and foster the values and requirements of the family. Now, this is 1981, which was 30 years ago. I feel that I must ask for a particular effort in this field from the sons and daughters of the church. Faith gives them a full knowledge of God's wonderful plan. And we also are supposing that tonight. God has a plan for every family, for every couple. And we, we, we use that as, as the reason and where we get our inspiration. Therefore, have, they, they therefore have an extra reason for caring for the family, that is the family at this time of trial and grace. They must show the family special love. And this is an injunction that calls for concrete action. Now, loving the family means, and this is very beautiful as a, as a program, no? it means being able to appreciate its values, capabilities, and fostering them always. So it's the power of the family, the, the capabilities and the values that are inherent in the family. Loving the family means identifying the dangers and the evils that menace it in order to overcome them. So first is the values, then the dangers. Loving the family means endeavoring to create for it an environment favorable for its development, both inside the family, in the community, and also in the state, in the city that we live in. And finally, the modern family is often tempted to be discouraged and is distressed at the growth of its difficulties. Therefore, it is an eminent form of love to give it back its reason for confidence in itself, in the riches that it possesses by nature and grace and in the mission that God has entrusted to it. So I'd like to frame our meeting tonight in that love of the family that we're trying to foster and that hopefully this, this study of uh, Amoris Laetitia can help us, illuminate us, and give us strength to do that. Then there's another call from the Amoris Laetitia, <clears throat> which was last year's. You know? Here, I'd like to under, underline, apart from other aspects, the realism <clears throat> that the Pope mentions and the striving for perfection. You know? And as he says this, as this exhortation has often noted, no family drops down from heaven perfectly formed. Mm -hmm. Families need constantly to grow and mature in the ability to love. So therefore, it's not something that drops from heaven, already finished, already closed, already packaged, and that you just have to sort of, with inertia, flow along. No, it's a construction. It's a construction here with the word growing. And we know in our bodies what that means, no? A baby grows into boyhood and, and then adulthood. And, and that's growth, where your different things become per perfected, no? different organs, different capacities. And, um, and, also, and also it takes time, it takes time. And then each, each stage is different. So therefore, it, that's important, that's the realism, he says. And then we shouldn't ask. We shouldn't ask to have the perfection that we'll have in heaven. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, the fulfillment we have yet to attain also allows us to see the historical journey that we make as families. And this way, we, we, sh we shouldn't demand a perfection, a purity, and a consistency, which will only be in heaven. So 
I mean, we, we, we count on our limitations. And that in family life is important, and in love. Because as we know, love has a, an, an element of idealization. When you fall in love with somebody, well, that's the most wonderful person ever existed for you. No? There's an idealization, and that's good. Because this person is great. This person is wonderful. No? No? But it is wonderful for you in a special way. So there is an element there of idealization. That when we meet then the, the, the everyday life, that can uh, go into difficult, have a difficulty. So the Pope is very realistic. They don't think that we're dropped from heaven already perfectly made. No? We must fight for it, grow into it. And that's the meaning, I think, of his uh, exhortation. And that's the message that I would like to leave with you, no? to, to, that, we, that we feel the beauty of the ideal, and we go for it. We go for it, looking for certain instruments, and that's what we'd like to offer, you know, certain ways to get at that goal, get at that goal, and not be frightened by the limitations that we find in ourselves and then in the other person. So that's the, the, the call of Let, uh, Amoris Letizia. All of us are called to deep striving towards something greater than ourselves. So on the one hand, realism. But that doesn't exempt us from the effort no, to go for the ideal. No? Let us make this journey as families, as couples, as walk together. What we have been promised is greater than we can imagine. May we never lose heart because of our limitations or even stop seeking that fullness of love and communion which God holds out before us. So I'd, I'd like to remember those two you know, uh, injunctions that calls the Pope John Paul. says, love the family and go for the specifics that he mentions there. You know? Especially I like give back the family the enthusiasm and the idealism that, that love and family has. You know? Uh, that's that's tremendously important. Uh, uh, sometimes I speak to groups, that's uh, a group there in Rome of, of high school, boys and girls. And it's sad to see that they, 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 they've lost, they, they, many of them have lost the, I mean, the ideal. You know? they, they're, kind of, they're kind of pragmatic about their own lives. And uh, then maybe when they fall in love, there's a, there's a, a re, a reboot you know, of that, but, but, that's, uh, but it, certainly there is, a, there is a, a pessimism or there can be. You know? so, so that's what I'd like to, you know? so we have our three symbols of you know, ordinary life is to make us grow, then no low cost is sufficient. <laughs> we, we want to go for the excellency and it's God's help that will form in with us that excellence. So now, um, I'd like to present the, the ideas um, of Amoris Laetitia. So here we can see the structure of this exhortation, which is the fruit, as you know, of uh, two sessions of a synod of bis bishops. You know? um, and therefore, it has a richness of, of, I mean, from all the world. And uh, I think this one expresses very well a, a very sort of positive message for us. No? So therefore, as you see, uh, the, no, the light of the word, the, no, in the light of the word, the, the word of God. Because the church, obviously, and every Christian must b uh, begin its reflection with what God thinks about marriage and what God thinks about family. Because no? if not, we, we lose a very, very important input about it. Then he goes to say the experiences and challenges of families today then looking to Jesus and the vocation of the family. And then the chapter four is love in marriage. Love in marriage. Then love made fruitful, some pastoral perspectives towards a better education of children. Then chapter eight, accompanying, discerning, and integrating weakness. And then chapter nine, the spirituality of marriage and family. So in all these chapters, there would be very very interesting reflections. Uh, we're going to focus on chapter four. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry, just let me say to you, in chapter four, which I thought I had made a slide also of that, in chapter four, uh, there's, um, there's four parts, uh, and we're going to look at the first part. <laughs> the first part is uh, <clears throat> the love, family love, conjugal love, must grow. Uh, it must grow. And in that part is what we're going to see, you know, how it's life sharing, how it has joy and beauty. No, I'm sorry, I'm distracted, okay? Sorry. The, the first part of chapter four is the hymn of St. Paul to love or charity that we find in the first letter to the Corinthians. And that's what I wanted to share with you, <laughs> okay? Because it's interesting to see that in this chapter that is about precisely love in marriage, he takes an inspiration precisely from the perfect example of love. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, uh, the Pope takes that expressions of St. Uh, Paul about charity, and we'll explain that now, and we'll apply that to conjugal love. No? Now, the, so therefore, that's the, that's the part we will be seeing. That's the first part of chapter four. The second part of chapter four is precisely um, my, uh, love must grow, must grow. And there he goes into the fact that it's life sharing, joy and beauty, etc. No, that's, that's the, thing. the third, the third part of chapter four is with the title of passionate love. So it examines the emotive, the emotions, the the sentiments, uh, and also the, the the sexual dimension of love uh, that's seen there. And then a, a, a last part is about the transformation of love as it goes through life. You know? So therefore, you know, we see it here, stuck in right in the heart of the, of the exhortation, love in marriage. Then we go to the example, you know, to see what, what is love. And then we say it must grow. Then we say we must be, keep it passionate keep it passionate, and then recognize also that it will have its progressive transformation according to the scenarios of our life, according to times, the time people goes out. So that's, that's what he's put in here, really is the heart of the exhortation, okay? Would you like to ask me anything or suggest anything? Uh, I mean, feel pre free to, no, I'd like to, I mean, be of the most service possible to what, to you, and therefore, sometimes you think you're saying the right thing, and maybe, maybe somebody has other has other interests also. So, in whatever moment you like, uh, please do it. Okay, okay. So this first part now has been a little bit disordered, <laughs> especially for the translators, uh, but now I hope to be to be more ordered from now on. Yeah? Okay. So then. We just read the text from where the Pope takes his inspirations. No? If I, St. Paul says this to the Corinthians, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. So we can translate that saying, even if I speak five languages, even if I work my no, my time, over time, even if I'm the most intelligent person around, even though everybody admires me, even though, even though, if I don't have love, it's a gong. No? If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Now you see something here. This community of Corinth was very, 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 very uh, rich in gifts, faith. Surely there was miracles in this community, people doing miracles. There were certainly prophets, which would be people 
in, uh, having great intuitions. Um, and then there was, this, there was a problem. Because in this community, they were dividing themselves. Precisely the goodness that they were having, the prizes that they were having, the gifts they were having, was creating division. You know? Oh, you see, I, I, I did that miracle, eh? How are you? What do you do? Hey, do you hear me? I speak in prophecies. And you? I've got a fater. I could move mountains. Yeah. But then I go off and gossip somebody's behind his back, uh, etc. And also, you know that situation where a community can be very gifted in fate, but nevertheless, it's not, it's not automatic to have precisely a lack of charity. So therefore, that's the first application here. A family, a marriage can be very gifted, very gifted, but we must make sure that it has that essential element of love. If not, even the gifts become a problem. If I'm, for example, a very, very persistent person, you know, I'm very, very you no, know, I've got a will of, of steel, and the person that has to live with me, it can be, it can be tough. It can be tough if there's not charity, if there's not love. You know? Oh, I'm very intelligent, quick. I might be married to a person who's not so quick. Hmm? And my patience is driven to its, ex to its extreme every day. Hmm? It's a gift to be quick. Hmm? But it's also a gift to be reflective. Hmm? And these two gifts can separate us rather than pull us together if there's no, if there's no love. That, that would be the message that he will be saying. So that's, that was the, if I possess, if I give all my possess to the poor, give alms, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Hmm? So therefore, from there, St. Paul said, well listen, I'm going to tell you what I see that is the love of God, you know, because he uses the word agape, charity, you know, which is a special kind of word, to mean a special kind of love, which is precisely that of God. But he certainly wants us to live it. And in family, in marriage, there's the privilege of being able to live that with the sacrament, which gives you a participation in the love of God. So no couple, no husband, no wife can say, oh, that's beyond my capacity. I'm a poor woman, I'm a poor man. Yeah. But your love for him and for her has been enriched by the love that God has for him and for her. So I can say to my wife and I can say to my husband, I love you with my love, yes, of a man, of a woman, with all the qualities of human love, but that love is enriched, empowered, by the love that Christ has for you. So a husband that knows that Christ loves his wife and Christ tells him, hey, you better love her in my style. Eh? Or a, a woman, a, 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 a wife that knows that Christ loves her husband and Christ says, hey, I love him too. Eh? Eh? Now I'm very happy that you're doing it and try to do it, try to do it the way I do it. But, and I'll help you. I mean, it's not only to say, hey, you do something impossible. No. It's to give you precisely the grace to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to be able to do it, to love him with the love, with your love enriched by the, the love of God. And love her with your love enriched with the love that God has for her. Now, on that basis, we can think of this. No? We can think of all this. Okay? So now we begin. Um, I put here in Greek, not that I'm a, an expert in Greek, but the Pope sometimes uses the word in Greek to help us understand what St. Paul was wanting to do. And I find it, I find it useful. You know? For example, here, the translations usually say the first thing, love is patient. Hmm? And it's true. But the word 
macrotime, <laughs> macro, no? And time is kind of your soul. So he's telling us love has a, 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 no? has a very, very large heart, no? has a big heart, has a big soul, and therefore is able to put things in perspective. Hmm? You know how when we have something good going on, other things kind of fall on the side. You don't, re you don't realize it. No? I remember in Rome, uh, the journey to the university every day was, oh, today it's uncomfortable, it's very hot, it's this and it's that, no, and you're going to classes. But when we were going to exams, no? you were so concentrated on studying the last few notes for your exam, no? You didn't notice if there was traffic that day, if there was hot that day, if somebody said something. No? Because you had, you had a, a goal. No? And here I put the, the image of those three stone workers, no? working stone. You ask the first one, hey, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm cutting stone. No? This is what I'm doing. Oh, and the second one, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building a house. And the third one? So oh, I'm building a cathedral. No? No? It's the same physical work. But nevertheless, the horizon and the perspective in which I can see that work can change immensely the meaning of that work. No? So therefore, th th this is the first thing that St. Paul puts us. No? It's patient. Love is patient. What does that mean? It puts up with limitations. It puts up with differences. It puts up with you. <laughs> it puts up with the, with, the, no, with the little or the big no, uh, things of life that, that sometimes trip you up. And, and, and I, I count on that. I count on that. And that's very beautiful, you see, because it's the horizon that gives you the possibility. Love has a big horizon. It puts everything else in perspective. Therefore, love is going to be flexible. No? It's going to be flexible. How often we might see in a couple, in a family, no? that, that rigid, that rigid uh, attitude that, that breaks people. No? That breaks people. So, so that's the first, the first step that St. Paul suggests to us for the family, for communities, but also, obviously, for every, every couple. No? To have that... No, I want to be patient, but you won't be patient if, you're not, if, if your soul is not enlarged. If you don't, if you don't have a horizon, you know? as I say, if I'm just limited here to my computer, well then my, my reality, and I get nervous because a little sign about Karpeski virus comes up on it, and, and that's, my, that's, my, that's my life, that's my tragedy, you know? that's my tragedy, that, that little message of, uh, of, uh, of Karpisky, no, whatever you call it. it that's, that's it. And I forget about you and I forget about this lovely auditorium and the people that are here because I'm, I'm stuck in here to my little thing. And we know that that happens. We know that happens. And so therefore the first thing is to, to, to strive no, for, for that flexibility, for that. And it's not just stupid. It's not just I mean, ah, it doesn't matter. No, no. It means that you're, you've got horizons. You, you know what you're doing. You know what you're after. You know what type of love you want to offer and receive. You know people are imperfect and, and you love them still, etc., etc. Okay? Patient. Or magnanimous, if you like to, to use that word. The second quality of love is... Christos, that's the, the Greek word that's used. Now, looking at the dictionaries, etc., I find that that means a kind of doing, the, doing good, but in a practical way, in a, in a, in a very, very sort of ordinary way. It, it really means to make the good use of anything that you have. For example, I might have this instrument here, no? And I don't know what it is, and I, no? But then I realize that it, it can be used to change the, the slides. And therefore, I'm giving it, it's, it's, I, I bring this to its perfection. It's only a little instrument, but I'm bringing it to perfection. And that's a very, very beautiful attitude of love, you know, that two people that love one another are always after, the, the, you know, to make things work, to make things work. You know? and, and, and that's a very beautiful thing. 
No? Actually, uh, no, I learned that uh, this, I don't know whether you have here in Hong Kong IKEA stores. Think you do? Well, you know they have a, you know why they make, one of the reasons why they make the furniture as they do, that you have to construct it. You have to make it at home. You have to put the pieces together. No? So at the very beginning, that was not the only reason, but it was a reason to say, well, look, this helps families to get down on their knees and put pieces together and, and make, the, make the shelf and make this and that and the other thing. No? And, and uh, so that's, that's the meaning here of love as practical, as, as doing. No? Love is a verb, and without action, it is only a word. <laughs> No? There's only a word. And I'd like to mention here another thing. You know, there's a book called The Five Languages of Love by Gary Chapman. Now, one of the languages he says that he finds in couples that come maybe for, for help or for therapy in difficulties, that one of the reasons he said that they speak different languages. They love one another, but they express it in different languages. And they're not bilingual enough. No? So I might, have, I might be, speak to you in English, and you don't understand English, and you speak to me in Cantonese, and I don't understand Cantonese, but I love you, and you love me. Yeah, but there's no communication. It's not the right communication. So he, he claimed that, therefore, couples must be aware of that. And one of the languages is doing. There's people that love to see the other person doing things and not saying things, you know? And then there's other people I would like the same, you know? I'd like, me, I'd like to, to be complimented. I'd, I'd, like you, I'd like you to say that I'm good, that I'm beautiful, that, you know? And that, that fills me. Other people want, want gifts. You know? And you better bring a good gift. If not, I'll be angry, I'll think you're mean. Yeah? Uh, another person wants to touch, you know? I want to touch, I want to, the caress, I want to, the embrace. You know? And then the other person wanted what? <laughs> uh, gifts, uh, action, embraces, uh, and gifts, uh, what did I say? Quality time. Quality time, okay, <laughs> exactly. Equality, no? So some people say, hey, listen, it's, it's ages since you gave me a gift. Yeah, but I, I bring my work pay every month to you. Yeah, but that's not the same. Ah. No, that's not, it isn't the same because maybe she, he or she wants that, that language, etc. So, so this is important also to see. No? And then that doing good, I like this image also, is very, is very adaptable. Very adaptable. No? I mean, life changes us. Situations change us. And, and we must... We must Say, oh, well, I was going to do this, but now that the schedule has changed, well, no go. No. So I must be like one of these GPS. You know when you're in the car and go wrong, and you hear the voice says, do a U-turn, get back on track. <laughs> and the GPS immediately readjusts, readjusts the, 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 the direction and gets you back on track again. And that's a very beautiful attitude. No? Say, okay, we had a problem yesterday. We had a, a hitch up yesterday. We had a broken, uh, I mean, a, a, a flat tire yesterday. Everything went wrong. Yeah, but I, I adjust and get back again to this attitude of, to this attitude of practical love. So therefore, magnanimous and active, and active. Now we have a series of, and it's not, and it's not, and it's not. <laughs> So two big things it is, magnanimous, patient, and then uh, doer, creative. No? Uh, love is not envious. Mm -hmm. Now envy is a very, very particular sentiment. Mm -hmm. Do we find that in families? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we find it in couples? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we begin to feel that the other is better, more, this and that. You know? It can happen because we're, we're always making comparisons, even, even in intimacy of our family. 
you know? So then we must be careful. Uh, so what is the, what is the, uh, uh, the, the antidote of this? So what is the solution? Love the differences, the different roads, the different gifts. I mean, if I see you with gifts, try, try to enjoy them. You know? If I see my wife and my husband with gifts that I don't have, well, obviously, that is to be enjoyed, is to, is to celebrate those gifts. Now, it's not easy. Sometimes we have that little reaction of, of being less. You know? you know, these experiments that the psychologists do sometimes to make you, you know, one was to put a line and say, could you make that line shorter, but there, you're, it's not, you're not allowed to cut it? Do you know how to do it? Just underneath, draw a, a, bit, a longer line. And automatically, the one above is half the, is half the size. You've, without touching it, without touching it. You know? So therefore, the, 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 that is, is useful also, you know, to, to keep our soul very joyful about the goodness and about the gifts that each person has, to, to celebrate these gifts. To celebrate them, and and therefore, you no, know, to love to participate precisely in the joys, even of the one who gets all the opportunities. Let's say I say, well, somebody is getting more opportunities than I. Hallelujah, that's okay, that's okay. So it's not jealous. And Saint Paul, I think, was thinking of his community, that something of that was happening, even with good things, even with good things. It does not boast. And here then, the, the, the verb is kind of, um, it's fill yourself with air. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, this is my size. Now I'm 190 high. But if I fill myself with air, wow, you know, Father Ryan is really big. <laughs> but it's air, you know, that's, that's boasting. So, you know, not to be anxious to so show myself superior in order to impress others. How often we tend to say, you know, hey, I've been doing more than you. Hey, uh, you know, I never, you always. You know, I, 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 no, I always, you never. Uh, now it's five times that I did this and you. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's a way of boasting. It's a way of boasting. I mean, I mean who's pulling the family together? Who's pulling it? Who's doing the job? You know? where, where were you when this happened, etc.? So, so that's the idea here, you know, that, that we do tend to use our, our, our gifts and, and in some way, in some way make, them, make them bigger in order, in order to precisely to, to, to dominate the other, to, to put, put the other in his or her place, etc. You know? So as you see, the, it's, it's a, just a way of saying that you know, St. Paul, I think, had a very good knowledge of the human soul. And he's seeing that the love of God, you know, precisely as, as, a, as an image, as, as an example, and then inviting us to live in that way with our, with our love of every day. You know? And it's an everyday going, uh, an everyday, everyday uh, challenge. More or less the same. One is the boasting. You know? The other one is bragging. You know? Maybe in boasting, we inflate the thing, so it's not really true. You know? In bragging is more or less the same, I think. But again, here the word in Greek means, means to become pushy. You know? Bragging is the, hey, I mean, hey, I'm here. I'm, you, know? you know when you push yourself to the front of a line? <laughs> you know? uh, in Italy, we joke a lot about when there's any kind of a buffet. You know? And, we, and whoever is in charge says, now please line up and do the things in, in order. So the normal thing would be that everybody would start at one end and work, get the plate and then work through it and then go off to, to the tables on the other end. But after a minute, there's a huge big crowd right in the middle. <laughs> right in the middle. And if you want to eat, you have to. <laughs> no? So it's, it's interesting, no? You know the way we sometimes push ourselves? We, we, want, to, we want to have the, the upper hand. We're, we're more just. We're more, we're, we're more generous. We're more, no? We're more capable. 
uh, we understand things more. Oh, th th that attitude is what's meant here, you know? pushing. You, know? you, you, you kind of want to push yourself into the front. And, and that's not good. It's the expansion of our ego. You know? um, so therefore, I put some examples here from, from ordinary life. It's not marriage, but it's more or less to say, I want the biggest car, I want the flashy car, I want this, I want that, I want that. Now, on an intimate level, that can happen also, you know? that, that, we, that we let ourselves go by this need, this need to be, to be in the in, in first place, especially when there's differences among people, you know? um, we we value we value some qualities more than others, and we might think that we have those qualities or some of them. So therefore, yeah, I mean, my husband is good, but um, but, you know. Yeah, my wife is, is good, but uh, she's not, she's not my, st my intelligence, she's not my fortitude, she's not my whatever. No, that, that, kind, of, that kind of putting yourself up front, uh, which again is, I mean, in, in many ways of life we see it, no? We see it and it, I think it comes out very easy. I mean, I live in community there with Father Joseph. <laughs> And in community, you see some of that also, no? that you sort of, yeah, I'm better than that guy. No? I'm better than that guy. Disrespect. No? Love does not disrespect others, and love is not coarse or rude. No? Now, that's interesting. The word here in Greek also is interesting. No? It comes from scheme, scheme. No? As, if, as if it was saying that, well, okay, every person has his own structure, his or her own intimacy, uh, it's their, you know, his, own, his own self, no? his own self. And that self has to be respected. No? And this is where uh, the Pope uh, says that one of the magical words for every family, for every couple, you remember, <coughs> you see it afterwards, no? He says that there's, the first word is may I? No? So when I'm coming into your life, when I'm coming in home, when I'm coming into your, into your intimacy, when I'm coming into your, to your, your mind, no? And we, we no? Uh, when I touch you in any way, may I? No? May I? Because you oftentimes, it's oftentimes we see now that, that there are certain atmospheres of family, etc., where you kind of, people kind of feel free, you know? Well, if I want to left, leave off some steam, where do I do it? In the most vulnerable parts. And the most vulnerable part is not with your boss at work, not with the bus driver, but when you come into your house and you might sort of say, well, this is, this is part of being at home. Well, mm, yeah, okay. But, 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 no, it should never, never, never be disrespectful, no? And, and that's, that's a beautiful thing, no? It's, 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 it's courtesy, it's courtesy, no? These two ladies here looking at the, the no? At the tombstone, shiverly. <laughs> it's already buried, no? Already buried. So that's not true. Rudeness is the weak person imitation of strength, no? So, so... So this is another, another way of expressing, of expressing love, you know? not being disrespectful, and we can change that to positive, and say, be respectful. This, uh, use the word, may I, may I. And you, you see the magical effect of that? You know? I mean, that somebody would ask you, may I? May I, it's nice, you know? even though the person has a right. <laughs> even though the person has a right. Okay. Love does not seek its own interest. And here the word seek means, you know, you search for it till you find it. <laughs> you insist on it, you no? Know? So he says, the text says, you know, that we have our own interests and sometimes we become obsessive of that. And we manipulate things so that I get, at the end, what I want. Mm -hmm. And we know that that, that, kind of in, that kind of situation can develop 
in a marriage or in a family because, I mean, we know one another, no? We know one another. We think we know one another forever, no? And that um, would be a mistake to say, oh, I know you. I mean, that's, that's not true. I mean, and as we'll see at the end, no, there's always a new possibility. But anyway, uh, the, to seek, sort of be after what, what I want and to get it, I mean, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, but be insistent and be even sometimes, no, uh, uh, treacherous <laughs> to get it, to get it. Uh, manipulative, no. Uh, so therefore, no. And then there's no. For example, certain techniques where you use to make the person feel guilty, and then the person will give it to you, no. And then the person will give it to you. But that's forcing. That's forcing. So that's another aspect. No, not to be, not to be. I mean, ego-centered and ego-seeking. In a way, in a way, I mean, we do have our interests, and it's good to share them, but not to follow them with with that kind of bad seeking, no, at at any cost, as we would say, because then it breaks it breaks the relationship. Love does not let itself be provoked to and anger. Now that's no, love is not angry, but. It's very important to understand the emotion that anger is. You know? So anger is no problem in the sense that when you're angry with what you should be angry with, then it's a gift. I mean, anger is the other side of love. I mean, if I'm angry, you know, if I'm angry, it's because I'm losing something that I that I want or that I care for, okay? Now, the important thing is that, I'm, that the thing that I want is correct, is good. You know? <clears throat> I mean, if I'm angry because you didn't, you didn't um, give me your money, <laughs> I mean, if I'm a, a, a thief and I say, hey, hands up, give me your money, and you don't give it to me and, you're, and I get angry, well, that's obviously not, the object of the anger is not good. But when the object of the anger is good, that's okay. That's okay to, have, to be angry. I mean, if somebody touches your wife, your husband, your child, if somebody wants to rob your, your house, if somebody wants to hit you, if somebody wants to do evil to you, you get angry. And, you, and it's good to get angry there, because that's your reaction of love for yourself, for your children, for your wife, for your husband, etc. No? Now, when we get angry, therefore, we must think, okay, it's not necessarily bad. I mean, the dinner wasn't ready, you weren't at home, you made me wake, and I get angry. Okay, now, just examine, why were you angry? What was the object of your anger? Hmm? Let's say you arrive late, and I get angry at you. What am I angry with? Okay, that's a good question. Why am I angry? Hmm? Now it might be because I'm worried that I'm going to uh, arrive late to see my person that I care for, etc. And that's, that, that is what I love and that's what creates the anger because I feel that your impunctuality makes, is making me lose this goodness, okay? So therefore, Anger, anger is, a normal, is a normal reaction to when something that we care for is going to be lost or damaged. Okay? Now, what the meaning here is you don't let yourself go with the anger. That's the art. No? If I love the person and I feel angry at that person, then I have to control the expression of the anger. If I just let the anger, I vent my anger as it goes, then I will break a relationship. You know? I will say to you, for example, oh, this is the 50, 57 million time that you're late, you're useless. Mm -hmm. That's a bomb that you put into the person's head. Mm -hmm. He said or she said, I'm useless. Did he mean it? No. Did he say it? Yes. Did the bad thought come to your mind? Yes. And this is another story, you know, that 
Even last year, I think I spoke about that here. Mm -hmm. Remember that we can hurt the person I loved, that I love, without wanting to hurt her or hurt him. Mm -hmm. Okay? I love you all. Okay? But I know that without any intention, I could hurt you in the sense of bore you, make you go asleep, you know, delay the talk, or whatever, no? <clears throat> I mean, every year, some of my students say, Father Ryan, I'm sorry to say it to you, but it seems, I know, yeah, yeah, but you know that you, no? But it seems that you improvise your classes. Ooh. If anything, I don't is improvise the class. But some of the students get that impression. Because I ask a lot of questions, I you know. My anger there, you know, is there. Now, but I'm, I'm creating, I'm, I'm giving that impression to them. Now, there might be a problem also, but that's not my issue now. I mean, I have to see that even though I'm a great teacher, I'm doing my best, I give that impression to some of my students. Okay? And I'd like to put another example. I was giving classes one evening to a group of ladies, and the room was very small, so when I can, spontaneously, I would stand in front of the group, not behind the desk. So that day I was standing there, and the first row was very close to me. So I said to the, the girl that was on my right, I said, what do you feel by the fact that I'm here? I was, let's say, a yard from her. And she said, I like it. I said, why? And she says, because I, I feel you, that you're interested in us, open and available no? to, 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 to a dialogue. And I said, wow. Because I felt that that was a good interpretation of what I am. I asked the other girl at the same distance, and I saw that she was kind of worried. And I said, no, tell me, what, what do you feel when I'm here? And she said, I don't like it. And I said, why? I feel you invasive and dogmatic. Okay, you get me? The same action was giving one person a pleasant sensation and the other person a non-pleasant sensation, but a very important one. She was feeling her vital space invaded. And that's, that's very, 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 very unpleasant. Okay? She had a different space than the other one. So, I mean, I was hurting her without any intention to do it. And the hurting was real. And we need to, we need to form our mind that we can do that. That can happen in our, in our marriage or in our family. Okay? Second point which is more important. When the person that's feeling invaded or you know, hurt in any way tells me that, then our first reaction is anger. I mean, that girl said I was invasive and dogmatic. And these are two things that I consider that I would never, never, never allow myself to be. So when she says it to me, my first reaction is, uh, that's anger. No? It's, it's resistance. And it's very easy for me now to say, hey, what's your problem? Oh, you see what I'm saying? Hey, what's your problem? But what am, I, what am I saying behind what's your problem? I'm saying, if there is a problem here, you're the problem. Because I'm good. You see your companion? She told me that was great. And you're saying that I'm invasive and dogmatic? You must be mad. You must have some trauma. No? You must have some problem. I mean, I'm just imagining my anger. No? So that's the meaning here. We shouldn't allow, we should be aware that we can tread on somebody's foot without wanting to. And especially the person that lives closest to me and 
24-7 and, and 366 days a year. <laughs> you know? It's very easy that we bump off of one another, step on our toes, and, and the other person says, hey, hey, well, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And our first reaction is anger. And that's why, that's why St. Paul says that it must be controlled so that we're not provoked to anger in the sense of expressing anger in a wrong way, which is precisely disruptive. Disruptive. Okay? So when somebody tells me something that, that's happening negatively, the first thing to do is get more information about it. Instead of being angry and reacting, I mean, that girl, for example, you know, if I said to her, hey, what's your problem? That's my anger. But if I said to her, listen, explain it to me. What's, I mean, what's wrong with you? I'd like to understand you more. <sighs> then, then we have the beginning of a dialogue. So, so that point is very important, not, not to, to be careful, not to demonize our anger, because anger is a good reaction to danger and to the things that are in danger that we love. No? So therefore, anger is always loving something that you see endangered. And it's very good to analyze our angers, to know why we were angry, and what was the good that we were protecting. And to see if that good is worth protecting, if it's worth protecting with a world war, or if it's can it be protected by just a very little, little measure of, of care, or does it, have, does it mean that we have to do terrible things, or whatever. But once you've identified the object and the danger, then you can sort of negotiate a solution. Then when somebody refers to you that he or she is hurt, be careful not to react with the, the, first, in, the first reaction, and not to express it like that, but to, to get more information and then dialogue about the solutions. So that, that point, I think, is very, is very useful and very important. OK, we continue. Love does not tire people. Make them tired. <laughs> this is another, another good one. You know? Love doesn't keep account of evil. You know? Hey, this is the fifth time. You've done it 24 million times. Do uh, you remember, you remember three years ago? <laughs> no? I had a, a situation, you know, that there was a, a person working with me, let's say, in the pastoral work of the university. And, um, <clears throat> but she was having kind of a, a difficult moment, etc. So I didn't want her to face another relationship with another person. So another person came along to ask me if, if, I, if she wanted, if she could collaborate. And I said, no, I mean, it's not necessary now, etc., etc. So it's just to keep them separate, <laughs> you know, and, and give her more time to, to develop. You know? Well, anyway, that was it. I mean, that was my reason, and that was... Six months afterwards, the situation had changed. So I needed to ask this second person for a collaboration. <laughs> and I, I had forgotten completely the first, the first, uh, the first conversation. <laughs> so I said, well, listen, would you be able to, to collaborate? Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, now, now you want them. Now you're not here. Before you told me this and this and this and this and this. No? So that happens. No? That happens. And it happens especially when you're hurt. You know? I like to make a difference also between just uh, hurting and, I'm sorry, with wounding. You know? If I ask you, last year, did you have a lot of hurt in your life? People that bump up against you, and you might say, yeah. Do you remember anything particular? No. Ah, life is tough and life is... No, we've just put up with one another, that's all. Yeah. You, you don't remember distinctly, but if I ask you, has anybody wounded you? Like that, you remember. Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm -hmm. At least, 
I'd say I've been wounded maybe three times in my life. Wounded. And I remember them like that. So, so I mean, the, the idea is that you don't keep account of that. So then afterwards, we'll, 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 we'll speak a little bit about pardon and things like that. Because the, the solution here is obviously pardon. OK? And, uh, and then we have to see that. But um, uh, at the moment, that's, that's a difficult issue. But it's a necessary issue to be able to move ahead, move ahead beyond the things that are happening. Um, OK. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Now, the, the Greek word uses injustice. Rejoices in justice. And, no? Now, justice is precisely that, giving each one his due. What's, no? Therefore, for example, no? Sometimes our gossip, our commentaries, our way of speaking about the others, it does not do justice to them. No? And this aspect that St. Paul mentions here is referred also to God. No? A couple likes to keep their relationship open to God, in peace with God, in justice with God, and that gives a wonderful basis to their relationship. So love will take care also of the relationship of each other and the couple with God, which is the supreme justice, you know, in the sense of giving God his place in our lives. And that's also a, an enormous um, contribution of the love that I have for the other person. You know? So therefore, obviously, with respect and with the measures that, that, are, that are useful, we, we, a, a couple shares that kind of a spiritual value you know, knowing that love, at the end of the day, is principally a spiritual reality. You know, it's, it's a person that loves another person, and therefore is concerned with, the, with, the, with the, the, the overall good. You know? I mean, when you, when you say, I love you, we could say, well, I, I, I love you, I want to make you happy. But then I say, well, OK, well, how, what's happiness? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'd like uh, this garment, I'd like this car, I'd like to have children, I'd like to go on vacations, I'd like you to bring me here, I'd like you to do this, I'd like you to do that. Okay. And then are you happy? Not fully. Not fully. Oh, then I have to begin again. Yeah. Then after another 20 years, now you're happy? Eh, not fully. So what is the reality, when you ask, what is the happiness of the person that sits beside you in your home? You realize that happiness is something that opens up all the time. I like to imagine us when we are born, we have our hands like this, no? And for a moment we're happy. Hey, here we are, just been born. Then what happens? Oh, I'd like something. I need something. I mean, I need food, <laughs> you know? And then when I've eaten, you know, I'm full and I'm happy. <sniffs> Go to sleep, you know? Then what happens? My hands open again, you know? And with time, now I want my little toy. Mm -hmm. ah! I do my little panic to get it. The, the toy arrives and I'm happy. My, my hands are full, you know? But then something happens, you know? I don't want to make too much of a... And then I'm left with my hands more open than ever and empty. Yeah, I remember I had the, the toy, I had the, you know? Then I say, oh, when I have a bigger toy, and the bigger toy arrives. And then when I say, oh, when I get my, my prince and my princess, and then I get him and I get her. And then I say, oh, when we have children. Oh, then with the children. Oh, when they're grown up and well educated and, and married and when they have their children. And I have my, I have my grandsons. And, 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 and St. Augustine, 
gave us the, the secret. He says, no, we're, we are unquiet, we're uneasy. No? So therefore, I like to compare it also with bringing water to a thirsty person. No? Your, your, your wife, your husband are, are, is thirsty, you know? and I bring a glass of water, you know? here, you know? uh, okay. Then he or she takes it, and then, hey, could you bring me another one, and another one, and another one? And sometimes I bring you a bottle, and sometimes I bring the hose, <laughs> and sometimes I bring a barrel, which is still hungry. So I realize you know, that you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be full until you reach the fountain. That's what you want. You know? So in all our little requests of happiness, in reality, we're asking, yeah, help me along, help me along, help me along to the fountain. So therefore, that's the ultimate justice of love. To be in love with the project of the person that's before you, that's beside you, and that project goes the whole way to the fountain. You know? And therefore, you must do everything possible in justice you know, towards that fountain, towards that completion of happiness for the person that you love. And that's, that's what it means here also. Uh, it does not delight in evil. So it's not happy when it's, when it's drawn back, when it fails, when it's under, you know, didn't make the mark today. It's not happy with that. But it's happy precisely with the truth. And then it's a, it's a nice word. Sin chayrei means happy together. They rejoice together. No, and that's very beautiful when a couple rejoices when they've 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 met a, a goal, when they've been when they you know, when they've reached some some something that they were proposing. That that rejoicing together is wonderful. And that's the that's the the nurture you know, of, of love. You know? Therefore, we're going towards the end. Now so we saw at the beginning, love is patient, magnanimous, and love is, um, is uh, act active, active. Then it says it's not envious, it's not this, it's not that. It doesn't, take, doesn't uh, keep accounts of the evil, and um, it, it looks for that supreme you know, uh, justice of the cup. And now St. Paul wants to drive the nail home. You know? And he says, love bears all things. Mm -hmm. Now, here the, the, the accent is all things. Because <laughs> no? love is able to live, we said it again, with, we say it again, with the imperfections. And it finds excuses and keeps silence in front of the limits of the beloved person. It's tolerant to the degree of impossibility. Generally, when you ask an older couple what is it that they consider was their secret, I've noticed that most of them will mention two qualities. One is patience, and the other is respect. So there must be something in that formula. You know? So therefore, love is capable of bearing everything. Now, that's a challenge for our modern mentality. We say, yeah, but, uh, no? Obviously, we're not speaking here about situations of abuse and of, I mean, pathological situations, eh? That's, that's obvious, no? But, I mean, it's good to say it. We're not, we're not speaking about that, no? But life in any couple can demand uh, a great doses of generosity and of um, um, putting up, no? The word that sometimes translates that is, it covers up everything. No? It covers up everything, which is a very nice nuance. No? It means that you're, you're complicit with it. And you say, OK, he did it, he, she did it, but no, we'll cover it over with, with other things, no? with other things. Believes everything, which means a, a, an attitude of, 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 of trust. An attitude of trust. And we know that that's, that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge. Because if, especially, you know, and not only, not only in reference to infidelities, you know, 
for trust in, in general. I mean, this person will be the person that I will bring to the goal and that this person will be a big asset that I will also reach my goal. You know? That kind of trust. And, and make, make the person grow in his capacity, in her capacity to contribute. You know? Because you see that sometimes, you know, that people are kind of stopped in their, in their, in their growth. You know? they're, they're kind of halted in their growth, and, and that's, not, that's not necessary, you know? that's not necessary. So therefore, you know, we, try to, we try to live that, that, again, a big heart, you know, a big heart. And that brings us to the word hope, which is a very, very important uh, attitude of love. You know? In some way, you know, the last phrase, there is a promise that inspires there's a promise behind us. So a couple is not alone. I mean, in this case, it's God. He said, listen, I created you. I invented marriage as a piece of heaven on earth. That's my promise to you. Yeah, but we're not, we're not feeling that now. Well, hope. Hope is to say, but the promise is there. So therefore, it is a certainty. It's still in the future for us. But that's precisely what we know. You know the way you, when, you, when you know where you're going, you go with much more ease and calm and, and strength. When you don't know where you're going, then it's bad. Then it's bad. So, so that, you know, and that hope then is what brings precisely maturing. Uh, the, it's, it's the hope that there's hidden possibilities in the person. Mm -hmm. hidden possibilities in the person that will come to the, you know, to, 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 to the front um, and if, if there is hope. Okay, so as you see, bears all things, believes all things. It's kind of a general attitude. Mm -hmm. Hopes all things because it's a person that knows that he or she carries a promise. You know? A promise and an anticipation, mm -hmm. and and uh, and I mean that is that is that is you not know, to live that in certain difficult situations is very. I mean we feel the need that all, that God can give us that kind of a strength, and therefore we go back to where we started. No, all this would seem would be idealistic if this wasn't also a gift that God gives us with his blessing on our marriage. Because mm -hmm. if it was just say, hey, you better do this and do this and do this and do this, no? we, would <clears throat> we would say what St. Peter said, I think, to Jesus. No, if that's the case of being married, better not get married. No? <clears throat> it, would be, it would be a torture. And that's what the Pope, what Pope Francis says. <clears throat> I mean, we shouldn't think that we're going to drop from heaven with all this perfectly aligned, but on the contrary, we're going to build into it and grow into it every day and overcome the difficulties that we find, and that's what makes us, that's what makes us do it. And then the final, all, <laughs> endures all things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is the active and dynamic tolerance capable of overcoming any obstacle. Mm -hmm. In that sense, as we see, you know, marriage is like, I like to compare it with an aeroplane. And <clears throat> you see it on the ground and you say, can that fly? You know? Well, then with 300 or 400 people inside. And, you know, and to get it up into the air means, I mean, thousands of little reactions and actions and and, and mechanisms that have to work. No? And nevertheless, it, it, it reaches that. No? They, they, it's, it's able to do it. Now, the two wings of that airplane, which is a, every couple, I like to call it, one wing is a very, very fine, delicate, attentive, and sensitive love for the other, which is able to, 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 to detect even the small 
uh, noises, attend to them, and you know, and 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 that gives us a, a very very beautiful relationship where I'm very attentive to what you like, what hurts you, what can hurt you, and I want to be very attentive to that. Now, we can't only depend on that. The other wing of the airplane is precisely a relationship that's able to take it tough. And I like to imagine those four, four um, what is the, the, the double drive on a jeep, no? It's, what is it called? When the, when, the, no? when the drive is on the four wheels, no? And you can go through very, very rough terrain. You can, no? Jump around and nevertheless, you still go forward because, because of the, the way it's made. So, no? Both a delicate and, and very, very fine attention to the other. And then at the same time, at the same time, the, the, the capacity of, of going, even when it's sometimes tough. No? So therefore, that's... Um, um, and then the last word of St. Paul is that, that love has no end. It, which means, no? we could say it also the other way around, love never loses sight of the end. No? Never loses sight of where it's going. So it never falls backwards. It doesn't degenerate and it doesn't bow to obstacles. Now again, as you say, as we said, we're speaking about in the first place the love of God. And we can understand that. Yeah, but he's God. Okay? But nevertheless, he wants to participate that love in us and with us. Now, what he wanted for us and for every family to be a piece of heaven on earth if it hadn't been for original sin, that piece of heaven on earth would be like a, like a, a, a very perfect, smooth surface level, and you just run on that. With original sin affecting each one of us, that piece of heaven now is at the top of a mountain. <clears throat> but it's still a piece of heaven. But you now you must fight for it. You must, you must climb for it. You must... You know, you must fatigue for it. And that's the effort that, we, that every couple feels the need, you know, to, to be attentive, to pardon, to, 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 you know, to make things work, to get back on track, etc. So in that sense, love doesn't generate and it doesn't bow to the obstacles. You know? And in that sense, love is our scrutinizer. You know? We know that <coughs> saying, John of the Cross you now has that expression, the end of our lives will be judged by love and in love. You know? So it's a wonderful thing to think that the many uh, welcomes that God will make to families you know? and say, you, know, you come in here because you, know, you love that person to the end with generosity and what you did to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. You know? so, so hopefully these ideas can help you and help others to, to put together the divine help that comes from grace, from prayer, from the sacrament. You know? with, the, with the human everyday effort of sensitivity, intelligence, affection, passion, you know? Put all that together, you know, and uh, that's the desire, you know, that, that our families and our marriages can live um, a happiness, you know, a human happiness, a limited happiness, that can be then a witness to others, you know. That is, that is something that the Synod and, and this document insists a lot, you know. I mean, Generally, we think that, well, okay, if somebody wants to see how God is, well, he might come and say hello to Father Ryan because he's a priest and a religious and all like that. But there's another where you can go also, you know, into any family and see how they put the children to bed and how they go around with one another and how they... And that that's it. That's love. You know? That's the love of God. So it's very nice that those two ways of God, no? God in the virgins and in the, 
no? in the priests, etc., is represented in his final goal. No? That's the eschatological dimension. But a family is the historical manifestation of God. No? I mean, you might say, well, to see God in me, you'd you have to project me ahead no? to, the, to, the final, to the final goal, which is heaven. Okay, no? Father Ryan might help me to understand heaven. But if I want to see something more concrete, I'll go into a family and say, hey, what's God like? No? What is the love of God like? No? And then, wow, <laughs> wow, so that generosity, that disinterest, that, mm, no? that must be it. No? So that's, that's the mission that, that we need to foster and, and promote so that, and, and couples must understand that, that they have that mission. No? Um, when I was ordained a priest, I mean, coming out of the church, I felt that I was different, that I had a power that I didn't have going in. No? I could consecrate bread and wine. I could pardon sins. I could give the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And I felt the kind of, this is the beginning of a mission. I'm, I'm a priest for others. Mm -hmm. Now, when a couple comes out of the chapel after getting married, they're invited also to feel something of that. Not, not something of that, the same, the same mission. I mean, to feel that, wow. Now we're married. Hey, boys and girls, look at us. No? This is us. This is what it is. No? And, and you, you, you have also that mission so that, so, that, no, so that you don't just look at one another, but you look together also at your mission in the world. No? So I want to invite you to that, that mission also. And may all this help us to, to do it better. No? Well, I thank you for your kind listening. And I hope, is there anybody like to make a comment or suggest something that can be? So here we come to Q&A session. So any questions or comments or sharing so that we can um, further our discussions on this topic. Brother Joseph. I was afraid of that. <laughs> well, what do you think is the greatest challenge in the modern society for couples to live this kind of love that we are idealistic? What is, I mean, yeah. obviously, this is very perfect and, and a high calling mm -hmm. with love like that. But today's society, you know, there are a lot of breakups. Marriages don't last. What do you think is, I mean, if you can name, I always say that, could be many things. What is the one or two things that you think is the main problem mm -hmm. that these um, couples yeah. facing today? Well, one, one is the, pre, the pre marriage, I mean, situation, you know, where, <clears throat> I mean, that's a main problem, that's a big problem, the way people think about marriage from sort of from when they're young and, and growing up. So that even if they have been growing up in a sort of a, an established family, etc., we know that, that they, they're not going immediately for that. So cohabitation and, and with that cohabitation, not only that's not only the issue of cohabitation, but it's the weakening then of what marriage is. I mean, okay, I, I can decide to, to, to have, I mean, cohabitation with my girlfriend or my boyfriend because of economical reasons, etc. But when you, when you touch them, you realize that that's not the, I mean, there is another issue. They're not sure. So, so they're afraid to get married. That, that's a problem. And the Pope mentioned it last year when he was speaking to on the, on, in the 14th of February, which was St. Valentine's Day, you know, he gave a, an audience to more than 10,000 couples in St. Peter's. And he, and he said to them, don't be afraid of marriage, of the institution of marriage. 
because that's the guarantee and that's to help you. But just don't be thinking, oh, marriage forever. No, marriage for today. I mean, live day by day, he said, and ask God, just as we say in the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. You should also say, give us this day our daily love. I mean, so, so that's, uh, that, that's one of the big problems. That is not only cohabitation, let's say, from the moral point of view, but it's also the, the, the weakening, the weakening of um, what they understand as marriage. No? And uh, so that's one thing. Then within marriage, uh, I mean, I've got a, I've got a kind of a fixation <laughs> in this sense. When, when, I, when I receive a couple or a person whose marriage is in difficulty, and maybe, maybe serious difficulty, well, the first thing you say to the person, well, listen, tell me, what's the st I mean, what, what happened? No, and say, no, well, my husband is this and that and the other thing, my wife is this and that and that. And when did this begin? How long ago? Almost everybody says, oh, very early. Hmm, very early. And, um, and some even say, from the beginning. One girl told me, said to me, the day I knew him. <laughs> And nevertheless, they lived 10 years as, I mean, fiancés. And they were 10 years married with two children. So I said to her then, I mean, why today after 20 years, something that you knew that was bothering you, why didn't it bother you here 20 years before? But anyway, but what I'm saying is this, I don't want to get lost. Uh, when you ask the person, they, very often they say it began at the beginning. And then you might you'd ask, oh, well then uh, must have been something very important, very, very painful, very drastic, very, oh no, it was, uh, it was stupidities. Mm. I've heard it many times. No, from the beginning, and stupidities. Okay, tell me some of the stupidities. And I find that they were stupidities. This girl in Kong is completely, when I said to her, when did it begin? And she said, the first day we went out together. And what happened that day? Well, we went to the beach. No. And he began to play uh, um, volleyball you know, with some friends immediately. And I got, a, I got my, my, you know, my, my uh, seat for the sun. And I, I took a book. But that guy was two hours playing with his friends. And I said, well, and what, what's the problem? Well, I felt ignored. Wow. Now, he's very, I mean, very much of sport and outgoing, and, so, and she's the country, hmm. as a person, as a character. So. Then I say, well, what's the problem? Well, he's always like that. Ah, OK. Now, is that a big problem? No. No. And as I say, I could give you, I mean, many examples, but I, just one more, no? Mother-in-law. No? This couple got married, and the parents gave them, gave them the gift of an apartment, but in the same building as the parents, OK? Normal. And a, a, it's a privilege for a couple to be able to say, I've got my house from day one. But the mother of her, her mother would come down to see her every evening, obviously. And he'd arrive home, and the mother-in-law would be there. Beautiful woman. Loved her. Till she appears in my house every evening when I'm, I'm arriving home. Okay, and they came to me, and they asked me. She, well, the, the girl asked me, "Hey, you tell my mother-in-law." I will not. And I certainly will not. And then she said to him, "Will you tell her?" And he said also, "No, I won't. You tell her." And she wasn't able to face up to her mother and say, "Listen, I don't want to see you here from five o'clock onwards." Just that, you know? And that's what he remembered years after. No? 
Now, uh, what I'm meaning with this is simply that every couple very soon you know, begin to find that there's things that are not as they thought they were at the beginning. It's like sort of they begin to bump one another in something, little ways, little things of money, of in-laws, of of going in, going out, of friends, and uh, the way you look, and the way you say hello, and the, your, the working hours, and whatever. So these little, these little bumps are to be taken care of. As I said before, you know, they don't realize, the couples, that they can hurt one another without meaning to, without wanting to do, and without realizing it. We must be capable of that. I mean, the, the problems that arise in marriage that would, might lead to a, a crisis afterwards, you know, it's these kinds of problems. You, know? you, you said you were going to come home, you didn't come home, you weren't home, you, you're out with your friends, you're too long on the telephone with your mother, you, 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 I didn't like the way you said hello to such and such a person. Uh, such and such a person, you, you know. So the, the little, the little things that happen, but then we don't, we don't realize that th th this is bumping. Now, <clears throat> hopefully, in any couple, many of these bumps just go on with life. Eh? As, as I said, we have to be tough, and, and we just get on, and we, and very often we do in the sense that we don't make a big issue. No, he, well, he was late coming home, and he didn't come home, or he didn't call me, or whatever. No, now. But we must be aware that even though that he or she didn't make any fuss, I just must be aware that this can be happening. OK? Now, couples are not aware of that. That's my first point. And therefore, they step on one another's toe. And without, without any, any bad, uh, bad intentions, or without obviously trying to do harm, but just doing my own thing. Hmm? I mean, I'm out with my friends, playing cards. You know, it's 10 o'clock at night. The game is going fabulous. You know? And I stay on another hour. Okay? I, I, I mean, I, I've done nothing wrong. But then I find my wife with a long face and an angry face when I get home. And she says, why could you not even call me? I forgot. I had a great hand of cards. Just forgot. I mean, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to bother you. I don't want to worry you. But he has done this. <coughs> he has done this. And as I say, that then when that becomes a problem, then you have situations that are incredible. I remember a woman coming to me one morning, and she had her dress stained by a liquid that she was going to drink that morning to, su to, to commit suicide. It was, a, it was a poison. And fortunately enough, she was so nervous that it fell on her, on her dress. I mean, it fell on the ground and, and stained her dress. She came to see me that morning. Just imagine. So that evening, I called her husband. I didn't tell him directly what was happening. I said, listen, I, see, I saw your wife this morning. She's very upset. Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with her. Mm. And uh, well, I, I mean, I saw her very, very upset. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but honestly, she has everything. I mean, we've got a, we've got a good situation. We have, a, we have, a, you know, we've got two cars. Uh, I've even put a, I've got a chauffeur for her when she has to bring the kids to school. So I mean, the stresses. And then we've just got a, a house also in the country, and I think everything is going well. Mm. And then I said to him, Yeah, but there must be something wrong with her because she's really, really, really bad. And he just said, No, yeah. And then, just to provoke him, I said, well, it might be an affair with somebody else. Oh, no. Don't be stupid. You know? And I said, um, maybe an angel from heaven, some kind of a possession of the devil or some molestation for the... <laughs> no, she, he didn't get the... And th then I said to him, who else is in the district? Who else is around her? And then he says, me? Me? Yeah. You. I didn't say it like that to him, no. <laughs> now, he considered that he was a good husband, working husband, giving everything to his family. 
but he was doing some things that was making her feel bad. Okay? Just another case. I mean, a couple get married, and uh, she's very sleepy. She likes to sleep on. She's, you know, she needs more sleep. <coughs> he has a very early start. And <clears throat> so they get up half past five every morning. She's there, make the coffee, make the breakfast, and very happy. And then she's sort of without sleep for the next two hours. And after about three months, she said, hmm, I mean, who's, I mean, is it necessary for me to get up? So she says to him, listen, I'm not going to get up anymore. Um, I, I'll prepare the coffee for you. I'll, you just have to plug it in. And she's happy because she said, I mean, he's big enough. He's big enough to plug in the coffee and the, I mean, there's no problem. Okay. It just happened that he was running to a very difficult period in work. It just happened that, unfortunately, he was also suffering a mild depression. So when he was making his coffee in the morning at 5.30 and listening to his wife snore in the room behind on this item, he began to feel lonely. He said, I'd like to have her here. I mean, it might seem even egoism, I'd leave the poor girl sleep, no? But he just felt that. I mean, I'd like to have her here with me in the morning. Okay. Did she mean to do that to him? No. Was he feeling depressed and lonely? Yes. They start there. So I would insist on couples to do a kind of a monitoring of that every six months. And as I say to everybody, so that you also may vote for me, when I become Pope, I will oblige every couple to have a double session of monitoring every year. It's going to be like Sunday Mass. <laughs> okay? I hope you vote for me. <laughs> no, in the sense of, so therefore, uh, I would, I mean, maybe I'm very sort of fixated on that idea, but at, at least from my experience, I see that, that you, you try to help a couple, you ask them, where did they begin? Very often they say at the beginning, so, you know, and then, and what was it? Oh, small things, stupidities, when there's no big problem. I mean, sometimes there's a big problem, eh? But that's, that's a 10% of couples. I would say 90% of couples have small problems badly managed. Mm -hmm. Badly managed. So I would say to, to try to, to, to get in there and make sure that in your marriage, in your couple, there's not, there's not noise that is bothering you. Now. There will be noise, and a lot of the noise you can eliminate without any problem. But if you're sincere and you know, well, this is a noise that I'd like to face up to, I'd like to discuss, I feel that it's, it's been repetitive and that it's beginning to be a problem for me, but then I bring it up. You know? I don't bring up everything because then it would be, I mean, it'd be, a, it'd be hell on earth. But I mean, if there's something that you feel honestly that, listen, I want to just, I want to communicate this, I want to share it. And then the second rule, what I said already, when the person shares some hurt with me, be careful not to let my first reaction of anger be become defensive. No? So I try to understand it more. And then we say, OK, now let's negotiate a solution. No? I mean, that girl with, with the husband that wants to get up at 5.30, well, he, she will explain to him, listen, I'm in a bad humor all day because I'm not having my nine hours of sleep. And he will say, yeah, but I'm lonely when you're not with me. Okay, what solutions is there? And there, there, there's three possible solutions, you know that, to problems like that. One is one concedes to the other. So she says, okay, I'm up with you. Or he says, no, you go in there, sleep away, and I'll go in before leaving and give you a kiss. And that'll do me. No. They reach a solution like that, where one gives way to the other. And that's it. But it has to be by the heart. Second, negotiate. 50-50, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. No. Uh, I'll tell you the night before how I'm feeling, or whatever. No? You, you look for some compromise 
and that's okay also, as long as also with sincerity and, and, and with, with the heart. Okay? And then the other thing in marriage also, you know, sometimes you have to say, we're in agreement to be in disagreement. I have to live with it. I'm living with a different person. You know? It's a man and a woman. Women are from Venus. Men are from Mars. You know? But the problem is that they want to go to Saturn together. Because if everybody stayed on their planet, that would be OK. You know? But anyway, you know, there are differences where there may not be a solution of compromise. You know? Okay. Now that's just supposing that obviously there's not bad things happening, etc. No, I mean, I'm speaking about the ordinary problems. No? Okay. I'm going to speak to my mother for an hour every evening, and I'm not going to stop that. Well, he might say, "Well, she's like that. It's a dependency she has. It's a it's a weakness she has. She's too much attached to the mother." Well, okay, but she's a great person. But she's a great person. You know? He's very nervous, he works a lot, he comes home late, he forgets to call me. Okay. And there's no way. I've, tell, I've told him 20 times already to call me when it's an hour late. And he just doesn't remember. That's okay. He's a great guy, I know he loves me, and I've got these 20 other proofs that he loves me madly. Now with this the idiot is not capable of remembering to call me. Hmm? So I mean, sometimes we, that acceptance of the other person in, in his or her conduct, I'm speaking about the ordinary things. I'm not trying to say he, he, goes, uh, he or she goes out every night and gets drunk. There we have a problem, obviously, which is not the same. I'm not going to say, well, yeah, OK, happy differences. No. I mean, that's a problem. thing is, in marriage, I find there's macro problems or problems that are pathological. No, let's call them like that, which would be dependencies, no, which be, would be drugs, which would be drink, which would be uh, uh, obviously today also pornography, or other types of dependence. No, that I, I have to speak to my mother every every hour. No, not every, not one hour every day, but every hour. Well, then maybe you have a problem. If you have that kind of a problem, obsessiveness, possessiveness, uh, obviously violence, uh, you know, manipulation, you know, that kind of problems, alcoholism, etc., they need special treatment. And the sooner the better. That they need specialized treatment and very often medical. You know? So I'm not speaking about that kind of a problem. But as I say, I'd say 80 or 90% of the problems at the beginning are what we could call ordinary. So a system of monitoring these, I'll just give you an example of a little questionnaire that you could do. Four columns. One is what I like about my husband, what I like about my wife. So a good list of things that you like, where you're, you're gratified, where you're happy, where you see, no, that's it. Second list, what I don't like about him or don't like about her. Things that bother me, things that, you know, uh, in some way or other that, that are not, are not happy, I'm not happy with, okay? That would be enough. But then it's interesting also to put another two columns. One is, what do I think that he likes or she likes? What do I think he or she likes of me? and of our situation. Because sometimes we think that we're doing good, and we are, but the other person doesn't give it importance. Hmm? Oh, I think that he likes a lot the fact that, uh, I mean, every, every Thursday I make him a special type of a, a food uh, plate. And maybe he, he wouldn't put that, he didn't put it in his list that he likes. So I mean, for you, it's, a, it's a, a card that you're playing positively, and it is positive, but he's not perceiving it. Now, he may not perceive it never, or he might just need to be called his attention to it. You know? so, oh, wow, yeah, 
I mean, I'll put it on the next month, the list, obviously, no? So sometimes they're like that. So the third list is what I think he likes or what I think he does, she doesn't like. And then the fourth one is, well, no, I'm sorry. The third list is what I think he or she likes of the situation of me, etc. And the fourth one is what I think he or she doesn't like of the situation. So what I like of you, what I don't like of you, I'm, I'm using that word, it's not very, popular, not very elegant, but what I like, what I don't like, what I think you like, and what I think you don't like. You know? And then share that. Hey, let me look at your list. You know? Hey, so you don't like this, this, and this of me. You know? And on my list, I think she doesn't like this and this. It doesn't appear. You know? So I, I put, I don't like the fact that you uh, uh, go out with your friends on, on Friday. You know? OK? And then when you put on your list what I think he doesn't like, you don't put that. So maybe you're not giving it importance that he wants to give it. And that's just to see that. What are, the, what are the intersections? And I think that would help a couple. You know, hopefully never to fight about it, just to express. You know? mm -hmm. Then there's other rules to be taken care of here. No? So when I'm going to say something negative of you, I try not to be aggressive about it. No? I mean, if I want to say to you, hey, I don't like the fact that you're very impatient, no? it's better to say it, it affects me a lot when you're impatient. I'm not saying that you're bad because you're impatient, but I say it, it's what's called I messages. I say, well, uh, I'm not happy, I'm worried when, when, you, when you're impatient, no? that kind of thing. So, sorry for the long the long-winded answer of, of what I think could help couples. Thank you for all this sharing. So, any more questions? <laughs> all sharing? I think there. <laughs> First of all, in, when, when I give the, this explanation, it's very common to see. <laughs> no? so, so that means that at least some of what I say is, is pertinent. No? I mean, I'm sure it is. Nothing, I, I would just say practice, practice, practice. No? Um, then with yourself, to, to convince yourself that there's no big issue I mean, you're imperfect, you're different, no? you've got limitations. No? And if one of these limitations is to, to, to react too much at the beginning, okay, well, we, let's work on it. I mean, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be scandalized by our defects, limitations, and things like that, because th that's the part, that's par I mean, it's, no? if you get impatient with me, well, I mean, it's a problem, but I mean, one of the ways to handle it is that we, we widen our mind and say, I mean, you're going to be imperfect, you're going to have things that are not going to, not going to sort of uh, be well, no, at the beginning or at the end or whatever, but I mean, uh, we face it. And, and so that's, I would say two things. One is that you yourself be happy with yourself and your defects and get to know them. Get to know them, and maybe the best person to give you knowledge about is, or at least one of the best persons, is the person that, that knows you more, and maybe more know, uh, frequently. Uh, but then get to know yourself, and get to know your, your, your reactions, and, and then ask your, I mean, I would just say to you, I mean, you or anybody else, ask yourself why the reaction? No? Uh, we know that, as I said about anger, and first of all, it's, it's anger. Okay, 
So if I say that your hey, your your question is terrible and you're putting me into a problem, no, you will feel angry about it because I'm making a ridicule of you're here in front of everybody, no. And your your reaction is, and that anger is correct, no. Just that you want to know what are you defending with your anger, okay? So so don't be afraid of that. So get to know yourself, get to know your angers or your reactions, get to know what you're after. I mean, why, why would you get impatient if he said to you something that you don't like? No? And then see, what, what is it? No? And it might be something that your own image, your own way of handling yourself, uh, your fears, no? your fears, no? uh, and, and express them. Say, yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I'm afraid that what you tell me now, you might say it tomorrow and the day after. And that would be a chain reaction, I mean a chain of, of, of bad moments that we'd have. And I'm afraid of that. Well, that's a wonderful sharing. No? And it brings out what's, what is the, 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 the reason why you're impatient or, or reacting abruptly. No? Um, so I would say those two things. Get to know yourself. Get to know your, your reactions. Try to get to know why you react. Try to, try to find out that, and that will help you. And then train yourself to, train yourself to, you know, as if a, a kind of a professional training, you no? Know? As I say, for example, a priest, you know, somebody comes in, comes into confession and says, listen, I've been, I've killed 20 people, you no? Know? Oh, you did what you did? No, you're trained to say, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> was, it, was it in one day or was it in two days? <laughs> I mean, inside your, <laughs> inside your, your, your boiling, no? But you kind of said, okay, now, now, what's, so it's a training also, no? So maybe those two things will help, no? <laughs> yeah. It's coincident that I was thinking something uh, very similar to what she was saying. My wife is almost perfect. <laughs> <laughs> she has no <laughs> when, when I saw that, um, when the father was talking about the anger, you know, I was just thinking about an incident that, um, that we have, that I just shared here. I, I believe men, in, in most men I know, normally don't show the anger so easily. No. Yeah, but we do have anger. And when something happens, you know, our anger is inside. We're angry, we're angry. But the ladies are almost jumping up very quickly, you know, with their anger. Before the man know, feel the anger oh, between us. And normally it has to suppress because the anger came out so quickly. Right? So um, it affects me when I, when I saw the anger. <laughs> so my anger is suppressed. Yeah. But after a while, if, if things happen again and again, then somehow someday that, that my anger also breaks breaks right, over. Right, yeah. right. So we need to talk, we need to compromise. So, uh, a good thing we, we know so many uh, good people in the uh, Catholic society, uh, we get help and we yeah. able to talk. Yeah. But it's uh, the, but it's I would say I would say to men the same thing anyway. I mean it is true that we when we have a problem we go into the cave alone with the problem. The woman, when she has a problem since she was a baby, looks for the group, the alliance. No? So a woman tends immediately to look for somebody to speak to. The man goes into his cave with a problem. And we do this in work, in priests, and, no? and better still if in the cave there's a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> so, so, so first of all that, but I would say that even men when they feel the anger and they have a tendency of controlling it more at the beginning in a certain way, but they should be honest also to know, to refer. I mean, if you're angry at something that your wife does or says, and if you consider it important, and I'm not saying that it should be an issue all the time, every time, but if you consider that it is an important thing, you might say to her, listen, that made me angry. Even though you're not jumping up and you're not furious and you're not red in the face, but your anger is there. I mean, it hurt you. 
No? It hurts you. So it doesn't, it doesn't need, as I said, to, 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 uh, even though you're not red in the face <laughs> with the anger, and it's not abruptive or uh, in, uh, disruptive and, and eruptive, but ne nevertheless you are angry and you, you know that. So it's good to, you know, if it's worked, if it's something important, to say, listen, what you did made me feel angry. You know? She will be happy that it wasn't too violent. And, uh, and that's the way the dialogue then, well, why, what happened? Oh, well, I didn't like the fact that you came home late. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I was with my mother or with my friend. Yeah, but it makes me nervous. Uh, so you speak about it, you know, looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. so, so I mean, I just say, you know, understand that the man's reaction is generally to, to close. And, and that's not all, that's not good. I mean, but that's our way of doing it, so we'll do it always. But anyway, be aware of that. And if it's something worthwhile, you share it. And if we share it in the right way, it doesn't, it doesn't do any damage on the country. It, it makes us, and she will become perfect like that. <laughs> that little piece that she's missing, you will help her too. To go <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'd like to thank you for, for the talk and also uh, what you said about the stability of the couples. Uh, those nine percent is uh, really uh, uh, you grow grow big and big and then yeah. uh, become uh, cases for divorces yeah. in the later part of the year of their marriage life. So I think. Uh, the talk also uh, talk about uh, the concern for those uh, couple, uh, married couples. We need more uh, attention to them. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, maybe it's a good idea to uh, design some questionnaire for, uh, like what you said about those four questions uh, for the newly uh, couple to come back to fill out those uh, questionnaire and discuss among themselves yeah. and resolve those. Uh, as a means to um, you know, strengthen their marriage. Yeah. That would be right? something good for the CNBC uh, to do. Uh, but but that, that led to uh, uh, my, my question about the divorcees uh, remarriage. Mm -hmm. remarriage. Because uh, there's a growing trend uh, uh, even during, uh, inside the church yeah. about uh, those cases. And, uh, uh, the the, the church is uh, all about those uh, uh, how do you uh, comment about uh, those? Uh, uh, how do you bring that back to our, our churches for those couples? Yeah. Well, I mean, the the the, the first thing is is clear in the sense that these couples have to be assisted, attended, um, they have to be taken care of. Uh, um, both the priests, the church, you know, the institutional church, as well as the community, we have to find ways of making them um, not feel, not not to feel abandoned or rejected or judged, etc. So that's that's the first big big thing, and it's not easy, neither for the couples themselves nor for the community, but. I think the road is clear in the sense we're all we're all Christians, we're all sinners, and nobody can say, "Well, I'm better than another," because Jesus doesn't want that. Um, and um, so, therefore, we have all the basis to make a community that englobes and embraces every every you no. Know, Everybody, you no. Know? The the Pope likes to use the image of the hospital, you know, a, a, a battlefield hospital. So, where people are brought in with with only one hand, with only one leg, with only, and everybody is welcome there. And so that's that's the first thing, you know. That's the first thing. From my little experience, they need a lot of that, you no. Know? I mean, obviously, well, you're you. We all know that, and um, then. Um, so that's the, that's the, to make them make them at home, no. So even though they're not um, uh, 
they're not completely regular according to you know, God, but make them feel at home with God. I mean, God is precisely the God of salvation, and, and we must encourage those people to make peace with God, you no? Know? Make peace with God. Help them to understand that they can be united with God in many ways, you know? in many ways. Uh, the church still, I mean, considers that they shouldn't have communion. Now, that's, that's a delicate issue. I think, I think the important thing there, at least in my experience, is, uh, is to, to, to teach them and help them to understand um, that that is their way, that is their way of loving God, of communion with God. You know? uh, I mean, apart from the discussion that would be very long to look at now, you know, the, 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 all the theologians that are working on that, etc. But apart from that, from my just very poor experience, I've seen that the, the, the couples are in peace if they understand that they're not rejected by God by the fact that they're not going to communion, that they have other ways of, I mean, in the church, of, of living their spiritual life and, and, uh, and you know, being with God through the Gospels, through the, the Scriptures. So, the thing is, we did, we've never done that really well, you know, except maybe in, 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 in sort of very sort of isolated situations. You know? But wherever I think a priest has been with the couple, explaining to the couple uh, their, the, how things are and why things are, and, and to make sure that they understand that they're not, they're not far from God, they're in union with God. You know, uh, and Pope Benedict said it in one of his discourses, you know, they're suffering. That abstinence from communion is a kind of a penance that is, that is making them holy. You know? in, the, in the sense that, you know, that these people suffer you know, that abstinence from the Eucharist. And, and Pope Benedict said, that's, that's a salvific suffering because it's, it's, out, of, it's out of love, it's, it's out of... So, so that would be my, I mean, the pastoral way of doing it now, you know? Uh, as I say, there's, um, there's many other issues to be treated, but, but I, at least I think independently of other things, that will be always necessary to help those people sort of understand that they're, that they're with God and that they get them working on whatever, whatever they can, you know, whatever they can. And, um, so, so that's what I'd like to say. I mean, as I said, there's many other issues going on now of the, the uh, I mean, the, the, the issue of conscience, you know, if you're convinced of your, your first marriage was invalid. I mean, many different cases and situations. And I mean, what being asked, and is absolutely correct, you know, that every case must be treated individually because it's not a statistics, no? It's not, you can't treat a person as a, no? That's why, for example, no? Many people don't like it anymore to have the category, no? Or the divorce remarried, as if it was a, as if it was a, a label that you could put on somebody, no? So, so and not, and by the, no? Not to just label a person and say that's it, that, because each case is very, very, Peculiar, very difficult. They are different. Yeah. But I'd say I'd say that's the important thing the, is that that God is with these people and that God loves them and that God is taking care of them and that and that we have to help them to to, to be close to God. You know? that's that's uh, and that's what gives them peace. That's what gives them peace. But the, the, it is very important to dialogue with them.
so that we can reflect God's love in our family. So before you leave, please find our donation box outside and your generous support it means a lot to us. And uh, we hope to see you all again in the future and may God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like also to thank the, the secret work of the translators. Eh? <laughs> Nobody sees them, but they're, they're always there. <laughs> thank you.